So how many of you were here last year when I spoke? Okay, that's good. That means I didn't suck too bad last year. All right. I'm just waiting for them to say, do you want to come back next year? Just don't, don't worry about it. Uh, so yeah, so uh, thanks for having me. I, I, um, I'm really happy to be here. It was a great crowd last year. So uh, um, today what I want to talk to you is about some of the, uh, uh, the different technologies we have out there today that we're using more and more. Um, and, and really focus on this, this, this concept of con consumerization of IT. Um, and really what consumerization is, is, is when we're basically uh, starting to use a lot of things that were not necessarily developed for business, but developed for the consumer market, um, and that more and more uh, users out there are starting to adopt because it's more what they want, um, and it's not necessarily what uh, businesses and enter enterprises can necessarily give them. So. Um, you know, we're finding that users are becoming much more self-sufficient when it comes to their IT and technology needs. Um, and, and we're really seeing this redefinition of roles and relationships, uh, you know, business users versus IT. How many people here um, use their own personal technology at work? Don't worry, I won't, I won't tell the IT people. Anybody here use their own iPhones at work? I'm sure there's more than that. So, so really, um, there's, there's, we're seeing more of this, this kind of reverse trend. Things like uh, BYOD. Anybody heard of the, the term BYOD before? I know my colleague here hears it every day. Um, BYOD, um, using social media by enterprises now, we're seeing that a lot more and more where companies are starting to adopt this as their primary type of communication with their market. Um, as well as things like using Gmail or Dropbox or... Uh, iCloud, these type of services that, again, weren't necessarily developed for business use, but are, are being slowly dragged into our businesses. And the biggest issue we see is that these services weren't necessarily developed to meet the needs of a business. Uh, you know, they were developed to share photos, they were developed to chat with your friends, but not necessarily as an enterprise-grade service. And we're going to see why that is a big, a big deal right now. Um, Forrester did a, a recent survey uh, that actually says that 37% uh, 30, of uh, employees are actually using consumer technology without the permission of the IT department. Um, I'm not going to spill the beans on any I Bell Line people because I don't know. How many Bell Line people here? Ah, I see. Uh, you, you know, and it, it's the way I see it, I, I don't necessarily get angry about it being an IT security person. I, I'm actually more disappointed that. As a business, you know, we're not doing things that uh, are making our people more effective as employees to the point where they feel they have to bring their own gear in, right? Um, you know, and also obviously where IT starts to lose more and more control over these assets, uh, a, lot of, a lot more risks start to permeate. Um, and then the common thing we see a lot of, you know, the, the uh, I have a 10 meg limit on my email account, so uh, every time I try to email you that, uh, that really big spreadsheet, uh, my email program, my, my exchange server, my mail server tells me it's too big. Well, what am I going to do? I have to get it to that person, so I'm just going to use my Gmail account. And we don't really understand the ramifications of, you know, what's going to happen when my Gmail account gets that email? What happens to it? How does it? Where does it get stored? Who has access to it? And so on and so forth. But again, people are just, they're automatically making that decision without really thinking of the ramifications. Um, we talk about mobile devices as well. I mentioned the whole, uh, you know, how many people had iPhones here uh, or other devices. Uh, I know one of the big things going around Bell Light now is, you know, from a corporate perspective, we're all using Blackberries, but we're selling iPhones. So everybody wants an iPhone, but we don't support iPhones internally. So what happens there, right? People really want them. They end up bringing two devices and they use their device more. And so, but we never think about things like if I use my personal device, and I have business information on what happens if that device gets stolen. There's no real process from an IT perspective on how to reclaim or, or destroy the data that's on it. They're, they're saying things like uh, cloud marketplace. There's this, uh, this uh, a new term they've come out with, uh, SOMOCLO, the social mobile cloud. This, this com the combining all these three things into one uh, business and starting to integrate all three together. Um, and they're saying that uh, Yankee Group has estimated about $340 uh, billion opportunity in the next five years 
Um, that's why we're seeing more and more companies, all these startups are spinning up, uh, you know, to offer new social type of environments, uh, more mobile apps, and so on and so forth. Um, but the big issue, again, s always stems back to the fact that these products were not necessarily developed uh, with the same requirements as a business application. So again, you know, they're really slower to adopt uh, the, you know, these, these security requirements that we, that we need, right? Now, from a cloud perspective, and I didn't put them all here, obviously. Is everybody familiar with some of these? Lunch must have been really heavy, right? Or I'm going to get the boot, right? I'm boring, so. Um, lots, of, lots of really good ones, and I'm, we're going to talk about some of the, the breaches that have occurred. Um, uh, for those who use iCloud or Dropbox, there's been a lot of problems with this lately, and we'll also talk about things like Amazon and so on that have had their share of problems, but there's probably like four or five pages of, of companies that are offering uh, cloud-based services, some that are very enterprise-like and some that are very consumer-like. Um, I don't know how many calls I get uh, from our operations center saying, uh, yeah, we detected another guy running Dropbox on his computer again. And then I look and I say, well, we have these other solutions to share files. Why are they using Dropbox? Uh, because it's easier and it doesn't have a limitation or something like that. So again, I think IT is so slowly missing the mark on, um, on what we have to offer to our end users, right? So from a cloud perspective, there are a lot of perceived benefits. Uh, you know, obviously lower costs for IT. I don't have huge data centers full of servers. Um, the previous, per, the previous uh, uh, presentation was on big data. Again, the cost of running all the storage and the cost of cooling it and power and all these things, all of those costs are lower because I'm actually leveraging somebody else's environment, somebody else's infrastructure, and realistically it becomes somebody else's problem. You know, uh, I, I mean, I've been in IT for almost 20 years now, and back when I was a sysadmin, it was always like, you know, 2 o'clock in the morning. Oh, uh, yeah, there's a switch that's overheated in the data center, and you got to go in and swap it out at 2 in the morning, and it's caused other things to die. Like, those problems just aren't there anymore from a cloud perspective because we rely on all the infrastructure that those cloud operators have put in place. Um, we don't have to talk about this whole ROI discussion with our, with our executives, uh, because, again, we're not buying anything, right? Uh, you know, access to these devices from anywhere or any place. These environments were developed to be accessed over the Internet, so now I don't have to worry about VPNs and uh, direct connections and dedicated circuits and all these things, right? So at the end of the day, I mean, the biggest draw is here is, is this whole CapEx versus OpEx thing. You know, we're no longer having to waste uh, all of this money on, uh, on running our own environments. Now... Those benefits obviously have risks. I mean, at the end of the day, you're giving up all of this control that you once had over what's happening with your data. You're now relying on the fact that that provider is doing everything they, they could possibly do to make sure your stuff is safe. Um, you know, you're, you're giving up uh, the additional controls you want to put in, the changes you want to make. These are all held by the, the actual cloud provider. Um, you know, data loss and leakage. Insecure APIs is a good one. Uh, my connectivity to that cloud provider, um, so if I have a business system and I'm connecting to storage in the cloud, that connection, I have to make sure because it's no longer within the four walls of my network, I have to make sure that connection is safe. Um, and not only do I have to make sure it's safe, but I have to make sure if it's the cloud provider providing that type of connection, you know, do I have any options if it isn't safe? I'm limited to what that cloud provider can offer me. Um, you know, there's other things like traffic hijacking and malicious insiders. Again, you know, I know at Bell Light we vet everybody that touches our data. So everybody goes through a background check and, you know, and we, we have, you know, physical security and they have, you know, badges and everything like that. When I talk to, to Amazon, you know, for all I know they have 10,000 employees. I don't know who any of these employees are or what their intentions are. Not to say that Amazon is all bad, but how do we know, right? We have no dibs on these people, right? Um, and then obviously things like uh, portability of my data and uh, a lack of auditor guidance and support, which we're going to talk about in a little bit. Some uh, big hits that we had this year, uh, Dropbox. Anybody hear about the Dropbox breach? This was a big one. We actually, uh, they lost quite a few uh, 
um, usernames and passwords of a lot of Dropbox user accounts. Um, again, you know, there's, and people are still using them today. No one's, you know, no one stopped using the service, but there was quite a big breach there. Um, you know, and Amazon seems to have uh, hacks here and there because their data centers are distributed over the world. We normally see these kind of these hacks that happen in certain areas of the world, but in this case, there's, this is one that happened in the UK. Um, anybody familiar with Matt Honan? Oh, if you haven't heard, this one's a really good one. So Matt Honan is a writer for Wired Magazine. Um, and this, this came out, uh, I think it was around August, yeah, August time frame, 2012. Uh, and there's a lot of stuff on the internet you can read about. It's very interesting. Uh, but basically, Matt, Matt Honan's uh, uh, data was hacked, and a lot of different providers, uh, you know, he was pretty much outsourcing everything he was doing, and all these providers kind of failed him in one way or another. Um, so basically, what was happening is he was having issues. He was trying to restore his iPhone, um, and when he was uh, on his MacBook, he was getting all these, uh, these errors that uh, were telling him he was entering his PIN incorrectly when he knew he didn't have a four-digit PIN. And uh, uh, basically, I'll show you a bit of the timeline uh, as to what happened here. So basically what happened, um, there was an attempted Gmail password reset listed, uh, it listed an obscure but easily guessable me.com or what, what is now iCloud address as a backup. Um, the Amazon, these hackers basically hit Amazon. They added a credit card number to Honan's account over the phone. So they called Amazon, they gave them that information um, and they produced a street address, which they basically got off the internet, and they produced an email address that they got through the, uh, the uh, password reset for Gmail as a secondary, password, a secondary email. Uh, they called back to say they'd lost his access, and they authenticated themselves with his name, address, and that new card number that he put up on, on Amazon. Uh, basically, Amazon's password reset screen showed the last four digits of the other saved cards. So he, they had that information. Um, they phoned Apple to request a temporary password and got one providing only a street address and the last four digits of the saved card. So you could see of all these different, these different breaches are kind of amounting to that one thing they're trying to get to. The reset email arrived to me.com, um, and then he put it in his trash. Uh, then an email was used to set a new password. Uh, the Gmail password was reset. It was sent to me.com again. And the attacker reset the Gmail password, then noticed an email again was sent to me.com. Now, shortly after this all happened, uh, the attackers at that point had access to his various credentials and his various accounts. So that's when they started to basically unravel his life in, in about 39 minutes, he says. So basically, they reset his password, his Apple password. Um, they reset his uh, Google account. They reset his Twitter account. Uh, they accessed his iCloud account, and this is where they really started to have fun. They accessed the uh, my, Find My Tool in iCloud, um, and they wiped his iPhone and iPad, uh, and then they went and remote wiped his MacBook. And he's a writer, writer and a photographer for Wired. He had something like eight years of data on his MacBook and on his Google account, including like eight years of photography and all kinds of things. Um, and that was basically removed, like within like, like they say, 35 to 40. 40 minutes of this hack happened. And, and we can see here that where, where the controls failed, um, this is just his Twitter account. You can see they, they uh, changed his Twitter account. That was the hackers that did that. Um, you can see here that basically the big failures were not the technology, but these were all social engineering attacks on these, uh, on these various cloud providers. So th they found all kinds of ways to get through a policy or procedure being run by these various organizations. So we found out that, for example, Amazon accounts can be easily compromised. Uh, Apple Care doesn't enforce any type of security questions at the time. Um, since then, Amazon's updated their policy. They removed the option for the over-the-phone account settings change. Um, and Apple was quoted as saying that they found their own internal policies uh, f uh, were not followed completely at the time. And they've since uh, removed the uh, password change request via phone because they couldn't properly authenticate the person that was trying to change the password. Um, he says he spent a little over $2,500 just to recover about half the data he had on his MacBook. Uh, whatever was on Gmail was pretty much lost. So if he wouldn't have relied on these cloud providers as much, 
You know, you can say that way, you know, he may have not lost as much data because they wouldn't have had access to as many um, online, uh, online information as they, they could have, right? Now, a lot of people that come to me, and, and don't worry if you can't read this, uh, it's, I just wanted to show you, this is actually off Amazon uh, Web Services page. Does anybody here use uh, um, EC2 or any of the Amazon services? Nobody? Pardon me? Okay. Um, one of the things that a lot of people come to me and they say, they say, well, I'm using Amazon and, uh, you know, they've been audited up the yin-yang. Everybody's audited them. They have SAS 70 reports, uh, SSAE 16 reports, SOC 2 compliance, all these great things. And they say, well, I, I'm going to trust them, right? Um, and, and those things are not bad. They're good. They're good to have. And, and it shows that the company has done a bit of due diligence. The problem we're going to have with this is, that we really, the, those, those type of uh, certifications or attestations provided by auditors, such as uh, SOC 2, SOC 1, or SSAE 16 uh, auditor reports, they're very generic. Um, and unless the, the provider actually publishes what controls were looked at from a security perspective, we really don't know to the extent of what the scope of that audit was. So they can go up there and say, we're SAS 70 compliant or we're SSAE 16 compliant or SOC 2 compliant, but without actually seeing the report, we don't know what was included in that, in that audit. So for all we know, they could have one data center, say the EC2 data center in Virginia, that could be like the, the best data center they have in all of their data centers, and they put all their money there, and that was the data center that was audited. But you find out your data is actually in, L in LA on their West Coast data center, you know, these audits may not may not cover, cover that data or those controls completely. Um, you know, Amazon talks a lot about things like password policies. Our passwords, and again, I'm not dumping on Amazon here. I'm just using them as an example. You know, cloud providers in general, th this is the way they operate. Um, they may come out there and say, we have great password controls. We enforce this, and you know, and, you, know you, can't, you can't get in here without a password of 10 characters or more. And again, these are all great policies and statements how well are they being enforced, we don't know. Um, we know based on the Matt Honan story that they had practices in place, good practices, you know, like we're supposed to ask them for this information when they call and we're supposed to do this, but we also know that those policies weren't being followed. So again, great controls, great design of controls, are they really effectively working at the time that your data is there? Um, now, if you haven't used Amazon, this is going to seem a little, a little bizarre. I'm going to explain what this is. So I'm sure some of you here have used uh, um, VMware virtual machines or some kind of virtualization. Amazon kind of runs on that same type of thought. Um, they have these things called AMI or, or Amazon virtual machines, and this is kind of the basis to the Amazon EC2 or Elast Elastic Cloud platform. You create a virtual, uh, a virtual system, and you run your application on that virtual system. Now, the interesting thing is, uh, although you realize you think Amazon's doing everything for you because you're outsourcing to the cloud, there's still a lot of work that has to be done. Uh, we still have to secure these images against external attacks. Um, we still have to look at sanitizing the image, and I'm going to show you a little bit about that. And the really interesting thing is there was an experiment done um, last year uh, that basically there's, there's a whole bunch of these different AMIs, different uh, operating systems, different configurations. So for example, and I don't know if you can see the picture on the, on the right there, let's say you wanted a Red Hat, a Red Hat Unix machine uh, running uh, MySQL and you were going to put your data in it. There is a virtual image built for the way you want to run your platform. So basically when you create an account, you pick the virtual image you want, you load it up, you do your thing. Um, so there's uh, 5,300 uh, or so AMIs that are available in different configurations on, on Amazon's Elastic Cloud. Um, and they're available in all uh, four uh, uh, of Amazon's data centers. So what these people did is over a period of seven months, they took a sample of all of these uh, different uh, AMIs and they analyzed them. And they looked for critical vulnerabilities in these. And what they found was that, you could see some of the things they were checking. So anything from like, uh, you know, uh, how 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 secure the uh, how secure passwords were on them to whether or not there were vulnerabilities on the system to whether they were patched or not, and what they did is 
they analyzed all of these images that were provided to customers to be able to use in the cloud. And what they found was that 98% um, uh, um, of those uh, uh, of, of vulnerabilities were found in Windows and 58% in Linux. They, all, they had critical vulnerabilities still in them of some sort. So this thought that I can just go to Amazon, not worry about it, get rid of my IT department, my security people, because I'm going to rely on Amazon, and use their image, their images were coming forward with all kinds of vulnerabilities already on them. They found 87 Debian AMIs. Debian is a, a Linux, version of Linux, that had uh, a notorious uh, vulnerability on them that had been around since May of 2008. These are vulnerabilities that IT security department uh, may pick up on and clean up, whereas these were inherent in that Amazon image, right? Um, they looked at uh, malware. They used a product called ClamAV, which is a free antivirus product, um, and, and loaded up about 850,000 signatures, and they found that um, two of the AMIs, both Windows-based, were infected with malware. Uh, both of them were Trojans. Uh, they did things like keystroke logging, and they did things like data leakage of saved files. These were located on images that were provided by Amazon to customers. Um, they looked at leftover credentials. They were able to find a bunch of credentials that were still on those boxes because the boxes had not been scrubbed or the, the images had not been scrubbed since last use. So uh, they found things like SSH. For those who know what SSH is, they found SSH keys that were still on these images. So when these images were built, uh, and reused and, and so on, all this information was still on them. Um, so obviously from, a, from the perspective of a privacy issue, you know, we're, 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 we're getting onto these images that are, are not necessarily well s secured. Um, and the other thing they found is data on these actual images. So what they did is they actually took a uh, random amount of Linux, dis Linux images and they ran the uh, ext undelete utility against them. And they actually found they were able to undelete 28 gigs of actual data that wasn't related to the operating system on these images. Um, they recovered a whole bunch of files. And they actually were able to recover SSH keys that could have been used to actually access images that were in use at the time. So these are the uh, encryption keys to be able to remote access the systems. So how does this affect me? Like, let's, let's use this example. You outsource your critical HR system to a company out there, which I'm calling HR Systems International, OK? HR Systems International, they say, OK, yeah, we don't actually have our own gear. We, we, out, we outsource to the cloud. Um, so basically, they, they uh, deliver an app to you, and they deliver it into the EC2 cloud. Um, they didn't build their own AMI by scratch. They reused an AMI that was provided by uh, Amazon. And uh, that AMI is actually loaded with vulnerabilities, the one they picked. Uh, not to mention, uh, you know, you decide to leave that company eventually, you decommission, they decommission the AMI, and it's loaded with your data because it hasn't been scrubbed properly. So from a cloud perspective, I'm not saying that Amazon and all these other cloud providers are, are a bad idea. I'm not, cloud, cloud providing is, is a good tool out there, but we have to not go into it thinking that it's perfect and that we can rely on all those controls at the cloud provider because in a lot of cases, they're a little bit sloppy and they're growing. So they're, they're getting sloppier and sloppier. So we have to make sure that we still go into this with that security mindset. Now, from a mobile perspective, you know, I'm doing on time. Uh, from a mobile perspective, uh, you know, we're looking at this whole uh, BYOD thing and bring your own device, personalized, personal devices at, the, uh, at the, uh, the business place. Symantec did a really good study uh, where they saw that 59% uh, of organizations are making the internal line of business applications available to employees' mobile devices. So more and more companies are pushing apps into the mobile area. Um, and when we get into things like personal devices being used, that becomes more and more tricky. 71% are considering an enterprise app store distribution. So they're looking at putting things into an app store, whether it be a private one or a public one. Um, and 31% are involved in a mobile management solution. And, and the biggest thing they're seeing today is, how do I secure this environment? 
they did a really cool study called the Honey Stick Project. This was really interesting. And for those of you who have, uh, um, for those of you who are allowing personal devices on an enterprise network, this, this, you'll find this very interesting. Um, what they did is they took 50 smartphones, they loaded them with a bunch of phony information, phony corporate apps, and then they dumped them all around in uh, New York, DC, LA, San Francisco, and Ottawa. And they left them around, and they provided a whole bunch of applications on it to be able to track what was going on. 96% uh, of the phones were actually accessed. So these are the phones they left out there. 83% of the attempts were to access corporate-related applications or data, including remote access to things like um, HR files. So these are phones that were presumably lost, right? 45% uh, attempted to access corporate email through those phones. 50% uh, contacted the owner and provided contact information to pick up the phone. Half. 43% uh, accessed online banking apps and 60% um, accessed social, and social networking apps. So losing a phone has a, a big impact. And if that is a personal phone or, or even a business phone that has a, a business data on it and it's lost, without something like a mobile management solution, we get into the possibility that you know, there's, there's great risk, uh, breach of privacy and, and loss of uh, access. Um, we have that personal uh, nature of device and the expectation of privacy where people are saying, you know, it's my device, I can do whatever I want, and that poses some problems because most organizations have no real, um, no real expect, they have clauses where uh, employees should have no real expectation of privacy. But now I'm bringing a personal phone and it's mine, I bought it, I pay for it, so how does, how does that work? Where, where's the line of separation, right? Um, and having to think of things like, you know, web surfing on a company device versus on a personal device. I can enforce certain things on the company device, but where does it stand with the personal device? Can I do that? Can I not do that, right? Um, personal data, like things like videos, personal emails, bank statements, tax returns, all that kind of information. Again, it's using, being used for business purposes, but it's a personal device. Um, what happens if I have to conduct a forensic investigation or some kind of review on a device. Uh, you know, if, if, uh, if I'm investigating a person and, and I need their phone, but it's their personal phone, how do I deal with that? Uh, this is, again, another problem, right? Um, what happens if the employee gets rid of the device? It's theirs. Eh, I don't like my old iPhone, I'm gonna throw it away. It's full of company information, but it's mine, so I'm gonna throw it away. We, we don't have access to determine what's gonna happen with that device, so what do we do at that point, right? Um, you know, and, and from a mobile perspective, you know, these devices are always on. Think, we never think of that, but when they're not connected to a Wi-Fi hotspot, they're connected to a 3G or, or some other mobile network all the time. So from a hacker's perspective, if there's a way they can get onto your phone somehow, it's always connected, right? Uh, and they don't have these traditional things we rely on from a PC perspective. Most don't have antiviruses or firewalls or encryption. Uh, some people do have apps they put out on their phones, but most of them don't. Uh, and just a quick chart here, we saw that 29% uh, of U.S. adults own tablets, uh, up 2% than three years ago. So again, going from phones into tablets and so on, we're seeing more and more uh, tablets. When I walked into this room, I noticed a bunch of people with tablets. I mean, it's, it's becoming more and more predominant, right? Uh, Android phone users? your hands down. It's not, not a good thing. <laughs> if you have an Android phone, you should be very careful. It is one of the worst uh, operating systems out there today. I'm not crapping on it. It is a known fact. Um, there's something like 400 million uh, active Android-based devices on, the, on networks today, and more than 600,000 apps available on Google Play. Um, and we can see here that um, at the end of the uh, 2012, uh, they had something like 350,000 samples of malware um, that were resident, most of them were resident on Google Play. So applications that were laced with malware, uh, websites that can be accessed because of vulnerabilities in, in the Android operating system. It's a very, you gotta be very careful with it. It's, it's one of the more uh, horrendous op operating systems for mobile type malware, mobile type uh, vulnerabilities. We'll talk about privacy here. TigerBot, look at some of the things TigerBot does. 
records the sounds on the phone, includes phone calls, surrounding sounds. It's able to uh, activate itself and start to actually record stuff that's on your phone. And the next time you connect to a Wi-Fi hotspot, the attacker can then go and gather that information that's saved on your phone. Uh, it'll upload GPS information, capture and upload uh, images from the phone. Uh, it sends SMS, uh, SMS messages to other phones uh, that it's trying to spread information to. Uh, it can reboot, reboot the phone. It can kill processes. This is all done by malware on a phone. Bot Panda was another one. Bot Panda would wait till you're on a wireless network or a, a 3G network, and it would actually start to communicate with a command and control server, say in China or Eastern Europe, and it would actually bring down its malware from there. So again, you know, people don't think of this. They think of it's not a laptop, and it's 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 got no hard drive or you know, no USB ports, or, you know, it's not a real computer, so how is this possible? But it is. I mean, it has a network connection. It can communicate. It can bring things down, right? Near-field communication. This is another one that's going to become more and more prevalent in 2013. I know that Rogers just signed a deal to become their own bank. You guys hear about this? They want to become their own bank so they can take credit card payments. Thank you. They can take credit card payments uh, uh, through their phones through near-field near communication. So this is where I'm able to walk up with my phone, uh, tap it to, say, a, uh, a, uh, some kind of smart pass device and make a payment through my phone. This is going to be more and more popular. Most phones today are wired for near-field communication. Uh, these guys, anybody been around? Has anybody seen these? I was in a cab a, just before the holidays in Philly, and I said, oh, here's my credit card. And the guy wa pulled one of these out, and I'm like, ooh, do I have any cash? Because like, he's scanning and he's like, oh, it's, it's not working. It's, and I'm like, can I get a receipt? He goes, well, what's your email address? I'll email it to him. I'm like, whoa. I'm like, hang on. And I'm pulling like dimes and nickels out. And like, he's like, no, no, it works. It works. No, I'm like, okay, you can keep that. It's your iPhone. And it's like plugged into the uh, audio jack on the iPhone. And it, it's, it's a scary, scary thought. But I mean, things like skimming cards, you know, all those things the, the RCMP says, oh, you know, these ATM machines are being skimmed. Like, this is the skimmer's delight. I mean, they, then it looks, you know, you go to a market like a, like a you know, a, a, fruit, a fruit and vegetable market and they're, you know, they're all taking cash and stuff and the guy whack, pulls one of these out and he's like, here all, you pay for your apples with your credit card. And then you go there the next day and he's not there anymore. <laughs> he's gathered all these cards, right? So we got to watch for these things. Um, just in, in finishing, the last section in social media, I just want to go through this. I, I got the 10 minute mark there. Um, Facebook that surpassed finally the 1 billion users in 2012 of October. Now again, their numbers, I don't think it's 1 million, it's probably more around the, six, the 600 million mark, mainly because a lot of these users they count are, are not active users. Um, but I really just, you know, just a quick thing. What I'm trying to show you here is that, you know, we're seeing this growing, growing, growing. We all know it's growing, but it's growing really fast. And take for example Pinterest. Anybody use this service? I personally really don't understand the significance of this, but my wife likes pinning stuff, so I'll just let her pin. Um, in March 2012, Pinterest already had 18 million unique visitors per month. Uh, they were uh, the third most visited social networking site in six months of operation. And what do they really do? Really? You know what I mean? Think of it. I mean, it's fun, I know, but what, really, what are they really providing to you? And they gathered that, much, that many people. Um, and the cool thing I found was, and the average people were spending 15.8 minutes on the site pinning stuff, right? Whereas on YouTube, they were spending on average 16.4 minutes. YouTube have videos. You know, I could spend hours watching YouTube videos, but on the average, people were spending as much time on Pinterest than, as they were on YouTube, right? And what does that equate to? Well, again, more social networking, more people, more possibility of phishing scams and so on and more loss of data, right? So like they had a bunch of these scams that came out, you know, where the ones where they would say, click here and you get some free Starbucks coffee. This started like within two months of the site going up. Like attackers are always like, yeah, I've really outused, outlasted uh, Facebook, now I gotta go somewhere else, right? So they knew there's a lot of people, it's another big site I can go to, right? Um, so from a uh, risk perspective in social networking, you know, there's a couple things we want to look for. Um, perpetual right to data is always a big thing, right? 
So like when your data is going up there, what's happening with it? And now that we're seeing social networking sites merge, I mean, we saw the whole buyout of Instagram, and we found out like a couple days later that uh, this whole thing where Facebook says, you know, now we have perpetual right to all your photos. You've got to be careful because uh, a lot of these agreements, when they sign up with other providers, if you're a big Instagram person and you like what they have to, how they treat your data, when they merge with another big social networking site that maybe you're not big on, you lose that, right? You're like, oh, I don't go with Facebook. I don't like how they deal with my data, but I like Instagram. And then Instagram goes and shacks up with Facebook, and then all that stuff you liked is now stuck in Facebook land, right? So be very careful that is happening as we go, as we go along into 2013. Um, single sign-on. Anytime you're going to be doing things like signing into one site and automatically getting into another and to another and sharing data, all these places have potential of uh, losing your data somewhere in transit. Thank you. So be very, very cautious about that. Um, the difference between effective marketing and privacy intrusion. This is a big one. Um, you know, what we consider is a good way of using social network to market things uh, can also be considered an invasion of privacy. So be very careful from a marketing perspective on what these sites are doing. Um, Location-based services, Foursquare, Google's Latitude. Again, these can be a possible uh, privacy nightmare. Uh, you know, do you want people knowing where you are at all given times, even though you're not allowing them to have that information? Be very careful when you sign up for these services. Uh, you know, we've seen these before, these pop-ups. Again, if it seems too good to be true, I know this sounds like a cliche, but it usually is. These things push malware. Uh, they gather a lot of sensitive info about you, um, and they promote their brands. They don't do much for you. So, you know, when people are trying to get you to get free Costco cards or free Tim Hortons coffee, then they're not going to reach out to you with free product through a social networking site, I can tell you that. Uh, just another recent one. This one actually came out in the news two days ago. Uh, for anybody that uses Zynga Poker or any of the Zynga games, uh, we had, uh, there was a breach, 16,000 uh, Facebook creds were stolen uh, through, a f through a hack that was using uh, the Zynga Poker game. So again, when we talked about this, this interconnection between social networking and gaming sites, you've got to be very aware that one is sharing information with the other. Uh, link, or Twitter. Does anybody ever get these? You go on somebody's Twitter page and they're like, oh, come and visit me or click here and look at this great stuff. Um, a lot of these you've got to watch out for because these uh, phishing type attacks or these uh, malware type attacks that are linked back to things like Twitter when it looks like somebody you know is sending you a message uh, with, uh, they want to communicate with you and it really seems out of place, it usually is. And I, I mean, I traced this one back and those URL shorteners, which are another scary thing, um, I actually dec decoded those URL shorteners and they led to some sites, here are these two Russian sites. And if you look at these two Russian sites, they're actually known, uh, um, to be f in fair to the Russian people, they're known like uh, Russian mob type sites. They're, they're owned by organized crime in Russia to, to gather uh, uh, private information. So be very careful with that. So in closing, um, you know, when we look at things like BYOD and so on, it's important that IT is on board. Uh, we're approaching it at Bell Alliant that, you know, it's going to happen. People are going to want to use their devices, their personal devices. It's important that uh, IT meets those people halfway and we come up with a solution that works for everybody. Like I said, I, I'm, I'm disappointed in myself when a user says, I hate your crap, I want to use my stuff. I, I, I come out of work saying, you know, I really haven't done my job. You know, users can't do their jobs. They think what they're getting is better than what we're providing. So, uh, but we really need to have enforceable policies and procedures and awareness training. People do have to understand that, you know, their personal devices, you know, that is not necessarily, thanks, that's not necessarily a good idea. Uh, we have to promote that, right? Um, BYOD, again, uh, organizations have to adopt things like MDM or mobile device management solutions uh, where we can do things like sandboxing. We can take our personal stuff and our business stuff and put them in two separate buckets. That way they don't collide and I have control of your business stuff and all the rest is still your personal phone. These solutions are becoming more and more prevalent and they solve the problem quite a bit. 
Um, social media, obviously, guarding your sensitive information, uh, you know, not to disclose information that may seem uh, private. Uh, you know, you really don't have any control over where that data is going or how it's going to be stored. Uh, providers, uh, when you're looking at uh, um, cloud providers, uh, go out there and ask them. Say, look, I want to be involved. I want to make sure that if I have an issue, I can audit you if I need to. If it's a big enough engagement with a cloud provider, they will make that available. Um, do you want to have some type of certification that they're actually deleting your data when you're not using the server? If you terminate with them, you want to make sure that your delete is not going to, your data is not going to stay resident on their systems. Um, you want to have encryption you can trust between you and them uh, and, and verifiable, right? Um, you know, we talked about the third party, uh, third party certifications and audits. They're still good to have. Just make sure you don't put too much weight on them because they may not necessarily apply to what you're putting up into the cloud. Um, you know, security clauses and so on, very, very important. Does anybody have any questions? <laughs>